And a warm welcome back to Talking Sheffield on this uh, Thursday evening, Sheffield Live TV, with Richard Kettleborough, Test Match umpire, with Chris Morgan, first team coach at Chesterfield, former uh, Sheffield United legend. They, they call them legends these days. I think you qualify. People who've been at clubs four years get called legends <laughs> nowadays, and it's so, that was why it's so rare that you were around for so long at that club. And you've got another old-fashioned word, testimonial. That's an old-fashioned word, isn't it? You don't see too many of them now. No, you don't. No, unfortunately. Uh, so it, it, it was good, the one in the summer. Uh, Newcastle were great, brought a lot of supporters down. Uh, ended up sort of 12,000, uh, which was mm. fantastic turnout, really. Uh, and a real good game, which I'd like to have got a, a few more minutes on the pitch. But, you know, I think uh, I was re respectful to both clubs that it was, you know, a, a proper pre-season game. But uh, it, no, it was nice just getting the last five minutes and, and being on the pitch, pitch towards yeah. the end of the game. Indeed. You, you admitted in the first half it hurt a bit to leave Sheffield United. Probably, probably hurt a lot. Does it also hurt you to see where the club is now, outside of the playoff positions even, and uh, getting quite a lot of flack from the supporters, which I have to say I understand why, because they're expecting a promotion bid this season. Yeah, I mean, to be fair, the, uh, the United fans, will, you know, they, they, they expect promotion... Uh, Every, every season that, uh, that the, the club's been in League One, and, and, and rightly so. But um, it's, it's not as easy as that. It's, it's, mm. a, it's a tough division, you know, and you, you hear people saying that over the past two seasons the, the division has not been as strong. Um, you know, but I think what, what, what they find at Bramall Lane is, is that away teams come, and we've heard over the years so many opposition managers saying it's like a freebie. You know, there's 20,000, 19, 20,000 fans. They just tell their players to go and enjoy the game. It's mm. a freebie for them, you know. And all of a sudden, teams are going out playing with no pressure. They expect to get beat. So mm. players, uh, you know, away teams, they come out, they play. And, you know, what? Well, unfortunately, they, they end up going out and playing well. They do. And, uh, but shouldn't Sheffield United, be, with the calibre of players they have, be able to rise above that? Isn't that part of being a Sheffield United player? It is. That that is the big thing about being a Sheffield United player, and uh, you know certainly the recruitment, um, you know, over the past few seasons when you know certainly when, when I was involved at first team level, that was that was a big thing that we always spoke about. It's uh, not uh, not only identifying quality players, but identifying players that have got the right sort of mentality to come and mm. play in front of 20,000 people when, you know, when, when the demand's so high, you know, and probably Nottingham Forest found the same thing, Sheffield Wednesday, Leeds, you know, again, big clubs at, at this level. And, uh, you know, it's, it's just, it's, it's one of the unfortunate things that the longer, the longer, you know, it's League One football, the harder it becomes, you mm. know, so... Uh, the but, greater the frustration which builds up, you can understand the supporters being restless, etc. Uh, you were very close to it, weren't you, with, with Danny, when Danny Wilson was manager. Mm. And I look back on that, and I know you probably can't comment, I look back on that as the time when the wheels came off, when he got sacked. You know, and uh, ironically enough, you took over. Yeah. That's, and that must have been very hard. It was very hard. Um, you know, it was, it was Danny and Frank that had sort of, not encouraged me, they encouraged, encouraged the wrong word. Uh, I was injured at the time. They invited me to, um, you know, to, to come on the... On, on the coaching staff and, and sort of dip my toe uh, into the coaching, which which I'd always spoke about. Uh, and, you know, Gary Speed, he, he really encouraged me, you know, to start doing my coaching badges, get on that side. So when Danny asked me to, you know, I, it was something I wanted to do. So because I'd worked closely with Danny and Frank when when they both left, and obviously I was I was asked to take over, um, you know, it was, I, I felt like coming out, you know. I. I when Danny was sacked, yeah, yeah, I felt I felt loyal to um, to, to Danny and Frank, uh, you know, because they they'd done so much for me. But you know, you've also got a loyalty to the football club as well, you know, and uh, you're employed by the football club, and, and and I spoke to both Danny and Frank about you know sort of doing the caretaker job, and they both encouraged me to do it, which obviously made it a lot easier from my point of view then to sort of crack on and uh, and try and do the, the, the job. Yeah. You had two caretaker spells actually at Sheffield United, didn't you? Mm. Yeah, one after experience. Danny, one after Danny, and then one after uh, David Weir, David just before Weir. Nigel Clough came in. And then you worked closely with Nigel Clough. Yeah. And of course, each manager has his own ideas. So I, I was remember speaking to you last summer about your appreciation and respect for Nigel Adkins, but he obviously had his different ways and different ideas, and you went back, I think, to the under twenty ones. Yeah, that's right. At yeah. that point, so uh, there was no fallout 
but you were just looking to move your career on. Yeah, yeah. no, no, no fallout fall whatsoever. You know, it, it had probably been easy for uh, for Nigel to come in. Obviously, he brought Andy Crosby in as assistant manager and Dean Wilkins as his first mm. team coach. It, it could have been very easy for Nigel to uh, just to move me on. Um, mm. You know, sort of out of the way. You know, no, but uh, I, I sat and spoke with Nigel at length. He, he said that the under 21s was a real important job for him, and you know, he, he wanted me to carry on doing that. And, yeah. and I must say, I'd, you know, I'd, I'd, it, it was the first. It was the first season that I'd done the under 21s as a, as a as a sole job. You know, I'd yeah. always travelled with the first team, done the first team, and then you know, sort of gone back to the under 21s, looked after them for yeah. their games. So I was I was solely in charge of the 21s, and I had six six brilliant months with them. You know, and it was probably looking back that a real good thing to happen because I was I was on the coaching. Uh, on the pitch every day, mm. you know, doing different sessions, managing different numbers. You know, some days you'd have six or eight, mm. the next day you'd have 20. You know, so trying different things, working at different things. Did that work? Didn't it work? You know, so when the opportunity came up to go to Chesterfield with Danny, you know, I'd, I'd been out there on the pitch every day. You know, so it's uh, you, you sort of go straight into to the next role. Uh, and it's easier, you know, whereas sometimes I think when you work at first team level and, and Nigel Clough, he, he, he took charge of all the training sessions, he liked to deliver it. So yeah. a lot of the times you're, you're always assisting. Um, so probably the six months that I had with M21s lads set me up, you know, bet, better for, uh, like you just said rightly then, you know, as, for the next step in my career, um, you know, to, to go into League One as assistant manager is um, you know it's a, a lot more responsibility it's a strange way of life because you get a buffeting all the time Danny Wilson you work closely with he goes Nigel Clough goes mm -hmm. don't think any of us saw the timing on that one I don't know whether that surprised you when when that happened it did it did it yeah did. yeah it did it did yeah yeah well, I think well, <laughs> football's always full of surprises I yeah think, uh, you should never and, and really you should never be surprised you know because uh, anything I think strange things like that do happen but yeah well, yeah I was as surprised as anybody yeah. Um, stability. Sheffield Wednesday have not always had it, but they seem to have it at the moment. Um, what are you enjoying most? I know you said Forestieri, uh, Richard. I, I, we will come back to cricket in a minute, I do promise you. <laughs> but, but I'm intrigued what you think. No, I think there's a real good feel factor yeah. around the place. You know, the fans realise now that they've actually got a chance of getting promotion. I know it's been talked about in the past, but you actually look at the team that they've got now and it's a realistic opportunity. I know they've got some real tough games coming up in the near future. And I think, like Chris said earlier, every game in that league is tough, to be fair. There's no, you, you couldn't pick a winner from any game. Oh. So, but look, they've got to earn the right to get up there. Yeah, so chairman's first anniversary, uh, Dave Ponchanciri on Friday. Um, he can look back with pride because I think everything he said he would do, attacking football, spend on the team, better quality. He's done all of that and he's observed the traditions. You know, yeah. he's respected the traditions, Newcrest came out there. I, I find it very difficult to fault him. And if he has made any mistakes, as with the transfer committee, which I thought was a mistake at the mm -hmm. time, he's corrected them. Yeah, look, I think he's been an absolute breath of fresh air for the club. I mean, the probably only slight criticism you could have maybe is the ticket prices, you know. But he's worked on that. Yeah, absolutely. Producer. I think yeah. he's, he's listened to the fans. Uh, it's Football can be an expensive game now, especially if yeah. you've got a couple of children you want to take as well. Uh, and I think he's listened to the fans and hopefully they can correct that and uh, may, may it continue for a long time. Cause Indeed. We'll talk cricket as well in a minute and top and tail on, on, on the blades and the owls. Just a few uh, other mentions in the absence of uh, James. Uh, I really uh, I can't fill his boots. Apart from anything else, I can't uh, lose 30 years in the next uh, few seconds. So uh, we'll do our best. Hallam FC, uh, unfortunately, uh, Ryan, your winning run came to an end. 3-2 home defeat to uh, Glass Houghton Welfare in the week. I went to watch Sheffield FC on that night. That was Tuesday night, huddled together with 190 other brave souls. Uh, they lost 2-0 uh, rather to a very impressive league town. Uh, notably, 15 minutes into the second half, the floodlights went out. Pitch black, referee leads players off and says to the crowd, anybody got any 50p's? So that was the highlight of the evening, really, at the Coach and Horses uh, the other night. Uh, Worksop Town. I, I promised to mention uh, a guy uh, who tweets me quite uh, regularly, Mr Lavin, I think it is, uh, wanted a mention for works up this week uh, and we don't cover football teams outside the area as a rule but we'll you know within two or three days of him saying can you mention works up town they had this result works up eight 
Garforth Town won. And if that's not worth a mention, I don't know what is. Apart uh, besides which, they have a game coming up, a, a local derby, a North Nottinghamshire local derby against Retford, which is coming up in February, which is pay what you want. It's a pay what you want affair. It's a minimum of a quid. Um, it's on the 10th of February, Wednesday 10th of February. It's got to be worth a quid of anybody's money, maybe even two or three or four or even eight, eight quid maybe, to see works off against Retford. They are. We won't do it every week, but we have done it this week. Sheffield Steelers, uh, we had Jonathan Phillips, the captain of Sheffield Steelers, in here last week. And that, you know, everybody who comes in the studio goes off and does great things, you know. So it's always a good omen. They had two wins back-to-back -back over the weekend following that, a four-point weekend. Victory at Dundee, having uh, won at home to leaders Cardiff. They're at home this Saturday at Sheffield Arena to Coventry. Do go and check that out. Second in the table, four points behind Cardiff. There you are. Poor impression of uh, James. He's back next week. Let's go on to a little, little bit of cricket uh, at this point. Uh, Yorkshire. Uh, you played for Yorkshire in the 1990s. You were a batsman, Richard. Then you played for Middlesex. And you played for Sheffield Collegiate. And... I saw you quite recently. How old are you now, by the way? I'm 42. Right. Was it last summer? It was last summer, but I actually started playing for Sheffield Collegiate in their first team when I was 15 years old. Right. And uh, we had a very, very... I, I've been very lucky when I've played for Collegiate because we've always had really, really good teams with a lot of experienced players and a lot of real good youngsters coming through. I remember when I, when I first started playing, there was myself and Michael Vaughan, who yeah. was a couple of years younger than me. Got, in, got into the first team, we both progressed to Yorkshire together and then obviously recently we've had another young lad come through and uh, who's gone on to be a very, very fine cricketer for England. Yeah, indeed. And what a great rich history and tradition, heritage Sheffield Collegiate have now with the Michael Vaughan connection, the Joe Root connection. Billy Root's going to go on, I'm sure, and, and be a great player in the county game, if not the international game. Can you see, can yeah. you see that? Uh, Billy's, yeah. a, Billy's a very talented lad and uh, he's got the world at his feet. Uh, this year, this season coming up is a big season for him at Notts. Uh, if he keeps working hard at his game and takes his opportunities, then hopefully he can go a long way. Mm. But uh, no, well, everyone at, down at uh, Collegiate is very proud of our achievements, to be fair. I mean, I watch Joe on telly. I don't get the chance to umpire him because obviously I can't no. do England, but I watch him on telly now and I just think what a wonderful young player he is. Yeah. And the way he goes about it, he plays with a smile on his face, looks like he's enjoying the game. And he deserves all the success he can get because from being a young lad, he has worked his socks off to get to where he is today and he deserves it. Your boss is a pal of Joe Root, isn't he? There's a slight age gap, but your boss at Chesterfield. Yeah, your yeah. Manager. I, think, uh, I think Joe used to, uh, it started when, uh, when Danny was at Bramall Lane. Uh, Joe used to come down, yeah. he used to come watch the games. Big fan, and, yeah. I, and I, th I think he's been to, uh, to Danny's house and stuff. Yeah, I, th I think they're in quite uh, regular contact. Yeah. And, and Danny likes his cricket. Does is he only good at football? Oh, Joe! I thought yeah. you meant Danny then. No, <laughs> well, we no, know I'm not sure. We know. <laughs> I'm not sure, Joe. Yeah. Whether he plays or yeah, you're saying make, make an interesting signing, wouldn't it? Yeah, uh, 45. You scored, I think. Ground out 45 for Collegiate when I saw you batting. Yeah, I on your comeback. First time. It wasn't really a comeback. It was a bit of an emergency, <laughs> and uh, probably the first time I played for about 10 years, I think. And that's I think that's it. I think I'll a good call, it, call it a day after that. Well, your stats, you're the, you were the youngest umpire on the elite panel, or are? Yeah? Uh, I was at the time when yeah. I got appointed just after the 2011 World Cup. Uh, yeah, I went to that World Cup as uh, an international panel umpire, which is the one below the elite panel. Uh, got appointed to the quarter-final at the time, which was the home nation, India against Australia. Uh, that went really well, and a couple of weeks later, got the phone call saying... They'd like to appoint me to the elite panel of umpires, so obviously that's the the highlight. You can't you can't get any higher. No. But with that, obviously comes great pressure. I'm sure there is. Yeah, 33 tests, 62 one-day internationals so far, 17 t uh, international 2020s. Yeah, the pressure. You've got the DRS system. The, the, you know, you're always under pressure to get it right. It must be terrible for an umpire to be shown to have it to have got it wrong because of an appeal. Yeah, it's, it's uh, not a great feeling, to be honest with no. you, but uh, look, I think the, the DRS system that's come into cricket over the past, well, ever since I've been umpiring international cricket, it's been there, I think is good for the game. The last thing we want to do as umpires is make an error that affects the outcome of the game, very much like referees in football. 
and uh, so it's been good for the game. Obviously, from time to time, errors do happen. We're human beings, mm -hmm. and if you go back 15 years, there was probably two cameras at a cricket match, all at one end. Now there's 46 cameras at an international cricket match, yeah. and you've got slow mo, super slow motion, hotspot, Hawkeye, real time snicker. So there's there's no hiding place no. and. Uh, well, you say no hiding place. It's also a dangerous place. We heard in the first half of our your shin was cracked by uh, a vicious shot from from the other end. That's happening increasingly with, with the, the the greater strength of batsmen, the, the type of cricket that's being played, even in tests now. Great power and strength, hitting, incredible hitting. Uh, are we going to see? I remember Dicky Dicky Bird being hit more than once. Are we going to see umpires having to pad up? Uh, there's certainly some form of protection, I think, in the years to come. Yeah. And I think this has all been brought about by 2020 cricket, really, the IPL, the big bash in Australia, where there's a lot of money now in the game, an awful lot of money compared to what yeah. there was years ago. And guys are, guys are going there. Yeah. Like you said, they're fitter than they've ever been, stronger than they've ever been. Yeah. And uh, the game's evolving massively over the past few years. And yeah. Uh, yeah, it's coming. But when I first started, I remember David Shepard, the great late David Shepard saying to me, when we're talking about decision making and he said to me at the end of the day if you can look yourself in the mirror and say you gave honest decisions on what you saw you can sleep happy at night and i try and do that every day i go out there mm. do you have a similar approach yeah in i think career, um, playing I, I think it is i think it's just the same when you play you know i mm. think uh, you'll make mistakes when you're a player you know whatever Are you a cricketer a footballer you know you're gonna make wrong decisions and you know it's uh you know Richard, as, as, as a cricket umpire, you know you see you see the uh, the, the football last night with Man City, you yeah. know, and it's but pe people people make honest decisions. I don't I don't think it's um, you know nobody does it on purpose, no. you know, and uh, you, you're talking about there the strength and, and the speed, you know, the speed of sport nowadays, you know, all sports, everything's getting faster, you know, stronger, you know, and and so it's it's hard, it's hard yeah. for the. For, for the referees, the umpires, to, to get it 100% right all the time. No, nobody, mm -hmm. Nobody's perfect. No. You know, we, we, players make mistakes, managers make mistakes, referees, yeah, fine. It, it, surely that's that's part of the game. And it does annoy you, you know. Probably Roberto Martinez sat last night and thought, well, if, if, if we'd have had video replays, yeah. then potentially we could have gone to Wembley in a final against Liverpool. Yeah. You know, but again, you know, do we want to take all that out of the game? Good discussion for another day, perhaps. The word pressure is increasingly prevalent in, in professional sport. Maybe it's overused. But to what degree does 24-hour social media add to that and increase it? I, have you a view on that? I, I, I You're not on it. I don't know, use but. any social media whatsoever. I, mm. I, you know, and whether that's a good thing or bad thing, some people use it to, uh, to sort of network, to stay in touch, to stay, you know, I think... Um, you know, calling people, meeting people, staying in touch. Uh, but it is, it's it's huge and everybody always wants to comment, everybody's always got an opinion and yeah, people people have got the rights to an opinion. Mm. Um, you know, but I think certainly, um, you know, in, in in our line and probably uh, if, if Richard were to make decisions, then go and look on social media, and he's looking at oh god, hmm, hmm, yeah, hmm. yeah. You know, he, he probably well, he'd probably drive himself. He'd only hear insane. from the people who disagree with him, and he'd, he'd, he'd mainly. And I I have a theory that uh, social media is not representative of public opinion anyway, because you only hear from a minority of people yeah. who've got the loudest voices. I mean, at your club today, you f could be forgiven for thinking the fans of Chesterfield are going to drive the board out of town, mm. you know, and going to stay away from the next match. And it's just simply not representative, but that's the, the loud voice that comes across yeah. well, uh, we, all we the as, time. We as match officials and are not allowed to do any social media, which I think is right. Yeah. And I'll give you an example. Last Christmas, Boxing Day, I did a test match in Melbourne, Australia, India, and had a, had a really, really good game, probably my best game I've ever had. And I was, went back to the hotel and my wife was there. She said, oh, look at this on social media. Yeah. And I was getting a lot of praise. I was just like, <laughs> first <laughs> time I've ever wrong. looked at it. The next game, I got one decision wrong and got absolutely hammered. hammered. So yeah. I, I just don't, I don't take any notice. I think it, as, as a performer at anything, you're best off not. Uh, that's not advice I give to journalists because journalists, we're communicators. We need to be on it, really, in, in the modern world. Um, but you guys are in the firing line, and I often think, Chris, I don't know if you view on it, and I'm not mentioning any specific club, but I think 
that directors of football clubs and chairmen pay too much notice and yeah. too much attention to it. That's my view. I don't know what, what you think. Yeah, I, I think you're right because I think you've hit the nail on the head that you know you can have you can have a, an attendance of fifteen thousand people. You go on social media and there might be eight people making a, a lot know, of noise. And I know that might, but yeah, yeah eight, eight, nine, ten, whatever people yeah. and and retweeting and entitled uh, to their opinion. Yeah, of course. But distorting. Yeah, yeah distorting. exactly. Distorting. Exactly. Yeah. And I got I got told as a young player by uh, John Hendry. He once said to me, "Don't believe your good press. Don't believe your bad press." That's it's right. something that's always always stuck. You know, and I've, I've, I've no, no, I wasn't going to say never. You know, you, you pick, you pick papers up uh, when you when you'd played, and you know, he's always had a brilliant game. And then that'll be the Saturday, Tuesday night. You can head one in your own net, and you're yeah. the biggest idiot that ever wore a red and white shirt. But yeah. that's again. I used to give you four at least. Did you? <laughs> I was happy with four. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing how players really look and take notice of those marks. Yeah. You know, the number of players I've met have been disgruntled. You only gave me six or five. It's unfair. What they don't read. journalists hate it. You know, journalists do not like being told, "Oh, you must give every player a mark out of ten." Impossible. Mm -hmm. Unfair on the players. Unfair on yourself. Unfair on the public. Because it's not right. You can't watch twenty-two. <laughs> really, you can't. Where are you off to next? Uh, I leave next Saturday to New Zealand for yeah. two Test matches against Australia, which will be uh, tough games. Uh, both teams doing very, very well at the moment uh, in New Zealand. 50-50 for me, I'm, I couldn't call, couldn't call yeah. that, but, so I've got those two test matches and I'm going to be home for a couple of days before off heading again. off to India for the World 2020. Good to see England winning in South Africa, despite the debacle of the, the final test. Ah, so. look, I think England are, are a side that's on the up, there's no doubt about that, they've got some very good young players, yeah. uh, a very good, stable, experienced captain. The coaching staff are Who very good. repeatedly gets written off. He doesn't want to look at social media, surely. Alistair Cook. No, I wouldn't have I mean, so. the number of times that guy's been written off as both a batsman and a captain, he keeps coming back. Yeah. Well, if, you, if you look at his record, he's England's leading run scorer, so it's yeah, yeah, that's the answer. a bit harsh, really. It is, really. I mean, it's good to see Yorkshire players figuring. I mean, jo Johnny Best, though, in particular, just, just recently. Um, disappointed for Alex Hales. Um, he's had a tough time, hasn't he? Um, Jeffrey Boycott made some comments the other day, which weren't exactly kind. Let's say <laughs> well, that's that's Jeffrey, isn't it? But uh, no, look, it's a big step up from yeah. county cricket to uh, Test cricket, a massive step up. You're playing against the best in the world on a regular basis with the scrutiny of the media and everything. It's mm. and it's how you handle that. But uh, I think Alex, give give him time. You can't give a guy four Test matches. You've got to give him a bit of time to get in there. You'd say stick with him, would you? I would, yeah. I would whoever that may be, stick with, yeah. Okay, he's off to New Zealand. Um, where, are you, where are you off to? You've got a free weekend, haven't you? We have got a free weekend, yeah. Colchester play Tottenham in the Cup. Uh, yeah. And obviously we're, we're out of the Cup. So we've, uh, we've got a friendly tomorrow behind closed doors. Okay. Uh, obviously just to give the players... Uh, Who's that against? Players, uh, Leicester City, under-21s. Right. Yeah, I know Nicky yeah. Eden uh, down there. Uh, so they're, they're going to bring quite a strong strong team yeah. up. So, uh, no, it'd be a big good game. We just, we just want to keep the players ticking over more than anything. Yeah, and of course, uh, Danny will be busy on the phone and everything. So yeah. it's an ideal weekend, actually, not to have a game, really, because you can concentrate on that. Or he, he can. You're not he involved can. in that. So he can. You're not involved in that side. No. I bet you're glad you're not, aren't you? Yeah, <laughs> I am. I'm just, I'll concentrate on what the players are doing on the yeah. training pitch. Danny can do all the uh, the office stuff on the phone. and yeah. that, that's, that's why... Uh, that's why managers get uh, get the roles they do. Right. One day it'll be. One day, yeah. One day, hopefully. One day. Chris, Chris Morgan, thanks ever so much indeed, thanks, and thank you to Richard Kettlebrough. I hope you've enjoyed that. Thank you for being there. 11 p.m. repeat, and it will be on my YouTube channel as well. Thanks for your company. See you next week. Bye.